Bundy. Has anybody ever heard of him? Apparently he's like an amazing guitarist. Anybody? Okay, Justin. Is he good? Very good. Okay, he's going to be giving a concert. There's going to be an opportunity for youth and college students to hang out. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you can attend one of those, um, I, I promise you will not regret it. And the last thing I want to say is next Sunday, mark your calendars after church, we are going to have a brown bag. And at Cornerstone, when we have brown bag conversations, it's just an opportunity to invite the congregation, invite you, the people of Cornerstone, to come in and to participate and to ask questions when new things are happening, when changes are being made, when we're trying to think about what's next. We have these brown bag conversations, and we're a church that operates um, congregationally, which means you guys prayerfully and intentionally and intentionally um, help collectively make decisions for the church. And so this isn't a vote or anything like that, but it's just an opportunity for you to speak into the leadership um, and to ask questions about La Roca Covenant Church, which we have been, over the course of several months now, been talking and working towards having a partnership with here. They planted, um, Esmeralda and Arnold have planted uh, a church, and they're meeting in their living room, and they are slowly going to move over here and start meeting here, and so we want to do um, the best job that we can at hosting them. We want to ask the right questions. We want to be a blessing, and, and most importantly, leadership is very, very convicted that we want to create overlap and a partnership. We don't just want to host them or let them rent our space. They're a covenant church, and we want to learn how to come alongside and do this together in a unique way and be a blessing to our community. So um, if you want to come next week after church and just be a part of that conversation, there's going to be a woman from the denomination um, here named um, Juana Nesta, and she's going to help facilitate that conversation. So Thank you. And as we go into prayer, <clears throat> I do want to update you guys on Laurel. Ready? We shared last week that she was going over to Stanford to have um, actually a pretty significant tumor removed, and the surgery went well. So as far as getting the tumor out and all of that, she's recovering at home now. It was well, and now we're just praying and waiting on the pathology for what that is going to look like for her. A few of you have already reached out for me to ask you know, if you could bring something to her. Claire Owens is going to be, I think I saw her. Claire Owens, can you raise your hand? She is coordinating. She already has a list of people who like to bring meals. But if you know Laurel and you just, you know, you just want to be able to run out there and bring her a meal and some flowers or whatever, talk to Claire, um, and she'll help put you on a list to do that. Um, are there any other prayer requests today as we go in? I know that, um, Christy, you had just shared one with me. PJ's sister, right? Okay, so PJ, she's not here this morning, but her sister um, received a diagnosis, a brain tumor of some sort, and I know that she was, um, that was really hard for her to hear, so let's pray for PJ and her sister. And um, are there any other prayer requests, joys or concerns this morning? We haven't done this in a while. None. Yes. Cousin Suzanne. Okay. Okay. Josie, uh, stage four colon cancer. Phil. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. So she had a stroke. She's had a, a few medical issues over the last few years, and she's back at Brandel, which is not her favorite place to be, right? <laughs> so we'll be praying for her. Okay, well, let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we come to you, and we celebrate. We do. We celebrate what you're doing in our lives, God, and just even getting this this youth ministry update and watching these kids go out the door. I love what Paige said. I love how she said, you know, these these are the, the future of the church, but not even that. They are the church. And God, we celebrate that. We we love seeing the life that you are that you are bringing into our young ones. And God, I personally am grateful for all the ways that they teach me um, when I least expect it, you know, with the simplicity of, of being a kid and their questions and just their outlook on life. We thank you for that. We pray over them now as they are um, in their groups and having their lessons and, and just getting to know you a little bit better. 
And God, we celebrate all that's going on here at the church. We're thankful, and we are excited to see what you're going to do and continue to do with the vitality huddles and some of these other things that are happening. And yet, when we come to you this morning, we also bring heavy hearts about certain things. And, you know, it just seems like um, illness and cancer continues to wreak havoc on us personally, you know, and and um, every time I turn around, it just seems like there's somebody else to pray for. And God, sometimes we don't know how to pray, and we don't know exactly what's going on with people's bodies when it's just taken over by such a disease. And the treatment, I know even people in this room are going through treatment that is just horrific. And so, God, we just lift these people up to you knowing that um, because of relationship with them, we just love them, and we want to be able to do something, and we can't, and so we cry out to you, and we just ask that you be with them, that your presence be on them, God, that your healing touch would be with them, and Father, that even as we seek to walk alongside of them, God, that you would use us to be people of peace, to be your presence. Holy Spirit, would you guide and show us the way in this world where there's so much brokenness, and God, may we just trust you in that. May we know that there's just so many things that we don't have answers to, but God, you are good, and you are gracious, and you never leave us. And so, God, as we come to your word today, would you speak into those places in our hearts and in our lives where we need to be revived, where we need to be encouraged, so that we can continue to be a blessing and a light in this world. In your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, church, how you doing? Woo! Man, so we have finally arrived. It is the last sermon in our sermon series that we've called The Jesus Story. We started Christmas with the birth of Jesus. We went all the way through Easter with his resurrection. And last week, we talked about the Great Commission. And I want to just do a quick review to make sure um, you listened last week. As we talked, um, is Jesus gave us his command for us, for the church and for us personally. He said, I want you as a church, I want you individually to be people who go out and make disciples of the entire world. But don't worry, you're not going to be alone. And knowing that he was going to leave, he gave hints and and through that command of where he was going to be found by his disciples after he ascended into heaven. There were three places we said that we would be able to find Jesus. We'll actually talk about a fourth place today, but number one, we said Jesus would be where? At the right hand of the Father in heaven. We said that you would find Jesus extending his right hand because Jesus uh, spent his life devoted towards the hurt and those who were lost. And so you will always find Jesus in ministry in our world. And last but not least, we said you would find Jesus where? You would find Jesus at your right hand. Now, I think I heard last week that I may have called left-handed people freaks. Is that true? My memory escapes me sometimes. Um, Maybe I did that, maybe not. But I was talking with uh, Connie Stout, who is our seniors ministry director, and she she was she had a chuckle with God in the car. She was thinking about this, and she thought, you know, I I'm left-handed, which means I do things with my left hand, which means with my right hand I can always hold on to the hand of Jesus. So she thought maybe I'm more special than those people who are right-handed, and she started laughing in the car. So if you left last service feeling a little depressed or insecure or you didn't want to come back because I called you a freak, know that you are deeply and abundantly blessed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, hey, as the last series, as the last sermon in our series, I feel that um, as any good teacher, uh, to make sure that you've assimilated the information, I must give you a short test. And I gave the test to my children in the car, and they got most of it. And so I'm going to trust that as, as, as uh, you've been listening well, that you can pass the test. So let me give them a little pointer here. And here's, here's the question I want to ask you this morning. As we wrap up the series— I, as I've studied and prayed and thought about the life of Jesus, there are, there are four events in the life of Jesus that I would consider to be the most important events in his life. Now, just to define perhaps most important, when I say most important, I want to say those events or things that he did which have had the greatest impact on all of humanity or the greatest impact on us. Okay? There's four. Now, we're going to start chronologically. And so is anyone uh, bold enough to speak out about the first main event in the life of Jesus? I heard birth. 
Birth is the answer. There we go. Number two, Robert. Here in the blind. That was a really good event, and that spoke about a lot. That's not the one I'm going for. He's probably, you're probably more right than I am. Next main event, what do you think that I chose? Is the, the next. Teaching the temple. That was a really good one, too. That was good. Not the one I'm going for. What's that? The wedding. The wedding. Man, I'm just going to tell you what I came up with. You guys should have written this sermon for me, but I said next was the death of Jesus. Not that those other things weren't important, but if I could pinpoint the former. So we have birth. We have death. <laughs> yeah, can't forget resurrection. And last but not least, we have ascension. Birth, death, resurrection, and ascension. Now, as we study the life of Jesus, one of the things I hope you've noticed about him is that Jesus had a very unique relationship with his Father in heaven. In fact, there are points when Jesus would talk about how he was one with the Father, how, he, how the Father um, was glorifying himself through Jesus. And so Jesus would listen and obey and be led by the Father. And so what happens with each of these main events, these four events that we talked about, you can find the relationship between the Father in heaven and Jesus. In the first one, you see that uh, in the birth of Jesus, it was the Father who sent Jesus. So you think about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. The next scripture I don't have memorized, but in the death of Jesus, we have that the father willed the death of Jesus. In the book of Isaiah, uh, the prophecy in Isaiah 53 says this, says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And then it goes on and says, Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And Jesus responded to his father's will and said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. In the resurrection, we know that it was the father who raised Jesus from the dead. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, Does anybody want to claim these before they get broken? <laughs> Free for all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that woke you up. All right, Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul says, I was not sent here by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. So the Father raised Jesus. And last but not least in the ascension, when we're going to read it in just a moment. But what's interesting, when Jesus goes up to heaven, the scriptures don't say, and Jesus ascended into heaven. The scriptures say, and Jesus was, passive verb, taken up to heaven. And we know that's by his Father. So I believe that as Jesus walked with his Father, and he walked in this life, he knew the secret to life. He really did. He knew what it would take to live out his mission and to live out his call. And in every moment of his life, his secret was very simple. Jesus placed his life in the hands of his Father. In every moment. And in doing so, Jesus accomplished the purpose for which he was sent. I thought I'd reflect on each event here and give you just a little piece of of what I think Jesus accomplished. The first one Uh, The Father sent Jesus, but when Jesus came to earth, Jesus brought us revelation. In John chapter 1, John writes that Jesus is the light of the world. He came into a dark world and he brought light. He brought revelation so that we would not just know about God, but we could directly know God for himself. So Jesus brought revelation. The next thing is Jesus brought reconciliation. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, He paid the penalty for our sin. And the wall that used to separate us from God, Jesus abolished that wall once and for all at the cross so that we could be in a relationship with God. But let me ask you this question. If in the end of history as we know it, evil wins and Satan is victorious over God the Father, does it really matter if we're reconciled with God? Not really, does it? So what does the resurrection do for us? The resurrection is where Jesus brings us victory. In the book of Revelations, 
I better, I don't have this memorized exactly, but I wrote it down. I love this verse. Jesus says in Revelations 1.18, he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death. Now, if you hold the keys to a door, who, go, who decides who goes in and out of that door? The one who has the keys. Jesus has said, by my victory, I am the one who determines who will step through the door of death or not. In other words, I have conquered death and I am victorious. And so what does the ascension accomplish? Well, that's the question we're going to explore for just a few minutes here this morning together. So let me give you a little context for the ascension. The ascension is an event in the life of Jesus that happened exactly 40 days after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Now, over those 40 days, if you've been with us, you know Jesus did a number of things. If you were here for Easter, you know that Jesus was playing jokes on people, and he really enjoyed that. You might also know that um, there were some relationships that had fallen apart in the, in the death of Jesus, so Jesus restored relationships with his disciples. And the scriptures also say that Jesus was teaching about the kingdom of God during those 40 days. Now, Jesus was also teaching about the kingdom of God during his entire ministry, right? Now, what did it mean to teach about the kingdom of God? What was Jesus teaching? In a summary, he says, here's, here's how you're supposed to live. Here's what the kingdom of God is about. Love God with everything you have and love everybody else with the same love that you have for God. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, we're a people who grant forgiveness and love to those around us. And I think the only difference now Now that Jesus is teaching, I believe the same thing during the time that he's risen from the dead, is now he's proven that it actually makes a difference. Because you might think that by pouring yourself out and by giving your things away to love other people that it's a loss, but what does the resurrection show us? It's actually the way of God, and it's the way of life, and love has the final word. Now on day 40... The tone of the conversations with Jesus and the disciples, I believe, begin to change. And Jesus begins to talk about the Holy Spirit, and the disciples know that something really, really big is about to happen. So the scriptures say that they gathered around Jesus and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Of course, the disciples are thinking that the next big thing is that Jesus is going to restore the kingdom. Now, Jesus is going to do that, but his vision for what he was going to do is way bigger than the vision that the disciples had. Now, we'll say that for another time, but for now, know this. They want to know when God's going to intercede in history and change everything and bring about the final order, but Jesus says, not yet. But I want you to focus on the fact that there's going to be a power that comes upon you, and with that power, it is your job to bring my message to the ends of of the earth. And after uttering these last words, Jesus was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Disciples, why are you still looking into the sky? Lower your gaze, because someday he's coming back, but right now, I want you to begin to focus on the mission that God has for you. Now, I believe the ascension was completely unexpected, and so put yourself in the shoes of the disciples for a moment. Jesus has been back for 40 days. They've had a pretty good time with him. He's a wonderful leader. He's their teacher and friend. He's their rabbi. He's everything to them. And now, in just a moment of time, there he was, and now he's gone. How are they feeling? 
I think they're probably just a little bit shocked, wondering if this has actually happened. I'm wondering if they're a little disappointed, or maybe they're really sad. I mean, they've already gone through this before. They lost Jesus to a cross one time, and that was pretty rough. Maybe they felt similar to that time. But here's the thing. What they didn't know at that moment, but they would learn in the future, is that this great loss they just experienced was actually not a loss at all. It would actually become one of the greatest gains of their lives. The description in the book of Hebrews, I want you to see what it says. Hebrews chapter 9, 24. And the author writes, For Christ has entered, not into the holy places made with hands, or human hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on whose behalf? Our behalf. Jesus has gone to heaven for our behalf. Which is really enlightening to me when I was thinking about that because often when I thought about Jesus and I thought about what he did, I thought Jesus came to earth on our behalf. He was born, he was crucified, he was raised from the dead for our behalf. But it's so much more than that. He also goes back to heaven, not just to escape all of you because you're crazy or because he's sick of us or because he needs a break. He's gone back to heaven on our behalf. Now, I took like a ton of notes that I'm not going to share with you this morning, but here's what I can tell you. There are a lot of things that Jesus is actively doing in heaven for you right now. If you're here last week, he has all authority in heaven and earth, which means he, nothing goes Nothing happens under his watch unless by his okay and unless by his direction. But do you know the Bible also says that as Jesus is with the Father, that Jesus is constantly interceding for you? He is praying for you in the presence of the Father, praying what's best for you. Jesus is advocating for you. In other words, you have a cheerleader in heaven who wants the best for you, who also happens to be the one with the most power in the world. This is very good news. But what I want to talk specifically about because it's really relevant to our passage we just read, is what happens in heaven with the Holy Spirit. You see, in John chapter 16, when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure, he said this to them, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go I will send him to you. In the book of Acts, when Peter preaches the first sermon after the Holy Spirit has been poured out, look how Peter explains what's happened with the Holy Spirit and what Jesus did in heaven. Exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So what does this mean for us. Let's put our chart back up because I like charts. It's really interesting when you look at the four events of the life of Jesus. In each case, Jesus brings about something. He brings about revelation, right? He brings about reconciliation. And he brings about victory. But here's the thing. In his ascension, he doesn't bring something about as much as he brings something within, right? Here's what the ascension does. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit will live in us. You see, at the end of the day, I don't know, I know a lot of your stories, I don't know all of your stories, but being a Christian isn't about just doing all the right Christian things things and following all the rules and joining just another religion. Being a Christian is about being filled with the power of God who literally lives inside of you. And all these things that Jesus accomplished for us, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus actually accomplishes those things in and through us. 
In John 16, when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, at one point he says, you know, I'm telling you things that are going to be a little difficult for you to understand, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Revelation, and the Spirit will make things clear for you, which is kind of crazy. Jesus is saying, as I talk literally face to face with you on this earth, you can't totally get what I'm saying. But when I live and my spirit lives in you, you're going to get the things that you did not get before. Think about it. Reconciliation. You know what the Holy Spirit does? And the scriptures, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, listen, anyone who's going to be right with God needs to be born again or born of the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and he changes us, and he, he actually makes us God's very own child. We get to belong to him. We're not just reconciled with God like the wall's taken away. We get to walk with him, and we get to talk with him. And Jesus also brings victory in our lives. We don't have to be victims of this world forever because the Holy Spirit brings power. There's a scripture that I love. John, or Romans sixteen twenty, and Paul writes, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Jesus brings about victory inside of us, and just in case you forget the power that lives inside of you, look at 1 John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, but because you've overcome, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who who is in this world. If you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you just to take a moment and think about this. Do you understand that the fullness of God, the glory and the power and the wisdom of God dwells in you through the Holy Spirit? We are not just sitting here as natural creatures we are sitting here with the supernatural of God living inside of us. And sometimes, I know for me, I forget that sometimes. You ever forget that? Yeah. But take a moment and remember. Now, I don't know about you, but I would say I want to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I could probably give you a list of a ton of things to think about, but I only want to give you one thing to think about today if you want to experience God in that way. Does anybody know or remember, so we talked about this on Easter, what was the first thing out of the mouth of Jesus after he resurrected from the dead in the garden? Do you remember? The very first thing he said, the first word, it was Mary, Right? Mary went to the tomb. Jesus was over there. She turns around and Jesus says, Mary. But after Jesus says, Mary, you know what Mary went and did? She ran to Jesus and held on to him. And she wouldn't let go. And do you know what the first sentence Jesus uttered was? Mary, let go of me. Because I have not yet ascended to the Father. It's not that Jesus didn't want to give Mary a hug. He loved her very much. But Jesus knew that in order for the full power that he came to offer to be released, she would have to let go of him so he could ascend to heaven and send the Holy Spirit. One of the things I realized in my own life is I've sought the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is so often I have to learn to let something go so that I can experience the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes there's a sin that I just keep crawling back to that holds me, and I have, to, I have to let go of that. Sometimes in our lives it can be an addiction of some sort that keeps holding us back, and, and as we hold on to that, it's keeping us from experiencing the full power or presence of God, and we have to let go of that. Sometimes we need to let go of our own self-sufficiency, Sometimes we have to learn to let go of our personal ambitions and accept the ambition of God. Sometimes we even have to let go of our own notions of what religion is. Sometimes we have to let go of our insecurities 
Sometimes we have to let go of that control that we try to have over our own lives. And I don't know what that is for you, but you do. You know what those things are that you like to hold on to? And maybe, you can, maybe it comes to mind right now. And maybe this is the moment when God's saying, listen, do you understand that I want my full power and presence to live in you? Will you please simply let it go? You know, I love... I love the story of Connie that she shared about left-handed people. Now, it wasn't just cool because she did have the last laugh, but I thought, how neat is it that Connie can literally sit in a vehicle with her Savior and she can laugh with him? You see, Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus. How many of you ever laughed with Jesus before? Right? Now, if, if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you probably just think we're really strange. <laughs> and it's really hard to explain it to you until it happens. But when you have a relationship with Jesus and he's on the inside, you laugh with him sometimes. Sometimes you cry with him. Often you talk with him. But you discover that following Jesus is about knowing Jesus because he's not only at the right hand of the Father, he's not only extending his right hand, he's not only at our right hand, but he literally is inside of each of us. And if you don't know what we're talking about and you want to, it's very simple. Jesus doesn't make it hard for him to follow you. Jesus simply asks this, admit you're a sinner, believe that you need a savior, and choose to follow him and trust in him as your Lord and savior. And when you do that, he promises to fill you with the full power of the Holy Spirit. And so with that message, let's pray and come before him and ask him to minister to us by his spirit and to fill us with the power of his spirit. God, we come to you this morning and we thank you that you are God. We thank you, Jesus, that you came and walked among us, Lord, for our sake. And Jesus, for our sake, you also chose to go knowing that in your departure, you could do a great work inside of us. Jesus, we pray that we would take seriously and we would have the joy of seeing how great it is that you live inside of us, Lord. We want to know your power. We want to know your presence, Jesus. So Jesus, we humbly ask if there's something that we're holding on to, something that we can't quite shake on our own, Jesus, would you have mercy on us this morning? And would you give us the grace to open our hands and to let go so that with our hands we can hold on to your hand and know the power of your presence. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, there is nothing better. There's a man named Paul who says that nothing in all this world compares to knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I invite you to come before Jesus this morning and to confess that you are a sinner in need of a savior. And would you choose to put your faith in him and to follow him all of your days and then to receive the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you continue to work in our lives, teach us to walk with you day by day and moment by moment. And it's in your name we pray, amen.